What's up everyone, my name is Sarah Dietschy. We have another collective contest for you. I'm here with Miguel, who is an incredible visual effects artist, a filmmaker. So very excited to announce this new contest, but also learn a little bit about you. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, very good to have you. And how would you describe yourself? Well, I'm a director first and foremost now, but I come from visual effects. Um, so I'm definitely a visual effects centric Filmmaker. Maybe. What are some of the, the films that you've worked on? Oh my god, I've worked on so many. Um, first film was like Underworld Evolution, The Cave, then I went to work on Avatar, Night at the Museum, wow. the Thor movies. Uh, I've worked on so many, I've lost count. That yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Okay. Thor, Avatar. I feel like when you have a Avatar, you're yeah. good. Yeah. That's all the credibility. It, it wasn't mean. even called Avatar back then, it was called Project 880. So wow. it was a while back. So yeah. there were, it was kind of secretive in the yeah. beginning. Seeing that on the big screen, I'm sure was a crazy surreal experience. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So are you allowed to say what you worked on in that movie? Because uh, I imagine they had probably hundreds of visual artists on that. Yeah, that one I was, I came in very early on and I, I didn't work on it for as long as I wish I would have. It was, it was still when the script was being worked out. So it was in the pre-production. And I think when Weta read the script, they're like, this movie's gonna cost a trillion dollars. We have to go back and adjust something, adjust the script basically to make it more affordable. But I was working under Neville Page, who was a character designer and working per uh, primarily on the Banshees, the flying, mm -hmm. like their form of transportation. Mm -hmm. I love Avatar so much. And being able to uh, like have in your head a creature or something you want to make that isn't in the physical world and then do it in After Effects and all these programs. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. Yes. So what are some of the programs first that you work in as a visual artist, but now as a director? I'm sure you're involved in many other um, things, but take me through the visual effects, Miguel, walk, walk so through and process. The main core of everything we do is Maya. So Maya is like the foundational program. Everything even if it's done in another program, comes back into Maya. So it's almost like Premiere, Avid, like you could grab all this material from other stuff, but everything ends up coming to this one program. So Maya's the core. The sculpting is all done in Mudbox, which is another Autodesk program. Um, Marvelous Designer for clothing. So it's like a, a clothing simulation program. Um, and Nuke, so Nuke is like my baby, which is like a compositing program. So we don't use After Effects for anything, we use Nuke pretty much. I'm just Premiere After Effects Photoshop, so it's cool to hear all these programs that I've never heard of. Um, and I think this contest, the new collective contest called Behind the Door, there will be moments where you can add visual effects if you want to, yeah. but I want to kind of ask you about uh, the latest film that you worked on that was your your passion project, but it turned into more than that, where you the basically, yeah, yes. where you basically uh, shot a lot of it in your home, yes. correct? So tell me a little bit about that because I have a lot of questions. This is a project that took you three years, right? Maybe a little bit longer okay. than that. It's, it, it took so long that we're ashamed to say how long it took us. But uh, we looked at like the Robert Rodriguez book, Rebel Without a Crew, is that, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. And one of the things he says is use what you have. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, what do we have? We have a big warehouse space like this. We have monsters, like that's what, that's what we're good at. So we're like, let's make something about monsters, but let's not, what we didn't want to do is make a visual effects movie. We didn't want to make a bunch of monsters chasing guys with guns and then like, let's kill us some monsters. We didn't want explosions. So we were like, let's look into history and try to steal ideas from that. And that's when we found this guy called Grover Krantz, who was an anthropology professor in Washington State University who became obsessed with Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And he started being looked at as a kook and his thing became trying to convince people to give him money to go on this expedition to go find Bigfoot. And we started seeing the similarities between this guy trying to get people to believe in his cause to get money to go find monsters in the filmmaking process in a way. And it's something we didn't even realize until once we finished the film, but we're like, fuck being a crazy 
explorer trying to find monsters and being a filmmaker is really kind of similar. <laughs> like you're trying to convince people to give you money to do some wacky ass thing. So we're like, eh, it's kind of cool. So wow. we, we made the story around that and our film takes place in the turn of the century. So it takes place in 1910 instead of modern day. And we basically went through the checklist of everything they tell you not to do when you're trying to make a movie or an indie film. They're like, don't make it too long. Don't make it foreign language. Don't add too many locations. Don't make it period. <laughs> And we went through the checklist of every stupid <laughs> thing to do. We're like, okay, da, da, da. And the way we saw it is we're like, we want to go to a producer and be like, look, you know, these are all the things that you said you shouldn't do because they're difficult to do. We've done everything with lo little money. So give us a shot. Yeah. And coming from visual effects, I'm sure there was that temptation to say, oh, we'll fix it in post. We'll, we'll animate that. We will use visual effects. But what I noticed when I watched it is there's a lot of practical stuff. There's a lot of practical and stuff. And there's a beautiful blend of that. And so tying it back to the collective contest that we're launching called Behind the Door, it's basically using suspense. You know, maybe it's a little scary to tell a story in 60 seconds. So it's a 60 second video challenge. And my hunch is not everyone out there is, are going to be visual effects, um, you know, artists. And so maybe you can give us a few tips on practical things that people can do um, to not feel like, hey, you don't have to have these skills, uh, you know, with visual effects. But what are some of the practical things that you brought in that actually turned out better because maybe you used it practically? Well, first of all, I think if we were able to have done it practically, we probably would have done it practically. We only use visual effects when we can't come up with a different way of doing it. Again, we didn't want to just do visual effects for the sake of visual effects. Right. But uh, I think with this, pr with this challenge, just using what you have and not trying to force something that you, you like, don't try to make a period film if you don't have the, the locations or the, the, the wardrobe and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And just kind of use your limitations to your advantage. And I think that's really the best thing. So if you're on a boat and mm -hmm. make it, someone's knocking outside of your boat or whatever, but just really <laughs> use those limitations because it gives it more personality, I think, right. yeah. How does location affect the story? Maybe someone is just living in a boring apartment in the suburbs and maybe they feel like, oh, how am I gonna make something scary? But what are some things that come to your mind on how, cause you know, you just used the boat example, which yeah. is really great. Um, what are maybe, what can people focus on when making this uh, you know, 60 second video it, or like, you know, closets. Oh, that's scary. Maybe just doing it around your closet, the monster in the closet. Or... Well, I'll give you an example. Like we just finished another project. It's a series of like horror shorts that, that are being done with this musician called Ghost Main. And we do have some big monster stuff in there, but we noticed that the scariest stuff is when the closet slowly closes. It's the stuff that really is like, that's pretty, we could have just done that with like a string, right? right? But that's the stuff that people relate to because everybody has had like the cat hiss at the corner and they're like, oh my God, my cat sees like <laughs> Satan is behind me or something. In terms of locations, I think the crappier your location is, the more dramatic your lighting has to be. Hmm. So if your location sucks, that's fine, but now, the lights went out in your apartment and now you have to do it all with a flashlight or with a little point of light or with your iPhone light. Mm -hmm. So now the location doesn't matter. The, the sparseness of the location and the sparseness of the light are what adds to, again, you're using that limitation to your advantage. Mm -hmm. So going yeah. back to your film and how you kind of took different rooms in your own home and uh, blended it with you know, special lighting, but also a combination of visual effects. What was that process like? How long did it take you to set up, you know, a little set in your bedroom that you turned into the office for, for the film? That took a long time, partially because we, we, we really care about the aesthetics of things in terms of the furniture all had to be period uh, accurate. Everything had to be period accurate but we couldn't just go into an antique store and just buy everything because it became extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. So we were literally going on Craigslist and we've probably bought from every crackhead in Los Angeles. We would go to these houses <laughs> where the part, we'd go show up at the house and they had the furniture out in the front yard and, they're, and we'd be like, oh, this is great. Do you have any other stuff? And they'd be like, we do, but 
we can't let you come into the house. And they had like stuff all over their face and we're like, that's a meth house. This is a meth house. So, so moral of the story, be a little scrappy. So we were totally scrappy and we would get a lot of this furniture and we would have to figure out, okay, it's not perfect. We'd have to strip the paint and restore it. And that took a long time. Right. It was re learning how to become an antique restorer which is, has nothing to do with filmmaking and it's not something we ever want to do again, but I now know how to polish. Like I know how to stay in pine as opposed to oak and all this stuff. Stuff I'd never care to ever do again, but you had to do it, yeah. Yeah, as filmmakers, you're basically just solving problems in yes. any way you can. Yes. Um, and that involves, yeah, maybe going to some sketchy places to pick up furniture. Yes. You never know. Yes. Um, but I think it's so encouraging to see, because when you see the final film, it's so beautiful. It's so polished. Thank but you. then to see the behind the scenes and to it's, know it's that... It's far from polished, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And to know that you're, you're going through what any other you know, person who's making an indie film or even at the highest level, I'm sure people have to do some interesting things, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. What was, yeah, what was the transition like from being purely behind the computer to really taking charge, directing, well, putting I, the pieces together? I think the first thing that really scared me was I would sometimes see some short movies and I'm like, why does that look bad and I didn't know what it was and there was something where you would even see an actor and before they even opened their mouth you would be like that's a bad actor hmm. but I didn't know why I didn't know why did I know that why did I intuitively know that that was a bad actor or why did I not believe the lighting I didn't know how to break it down whereas in visual effects I could be like oh this is this and you have to put a bounce card here you have to do this you have to increase your GI settings or whatever but when it came to that I it was a complete mystery. I didn't know. I didn't understand what made a good image. What was causing the image to look bad? Was it the actors? Was it the clothing? Was it everything? So I still don't understand like how to make it perfect or what exactly creates the greatest image because I'm far from a master filmmaker, but I feel like I understand it a little bit better. And I feel like you coming from a place where you understand it technically first, I feel like that's the part that people get hung up on. So um, having that head start kind of in the technical world and knowing, hey, I have to bounce that off of here to get the reflection here. Um, but then I I'm sure once you get into real life, you have real life circumstances where, hmm, that doesn't compute. Yeah. Right? Yes. And I'll tell you one thing, like I think one of the good things of coming from the technical side first is once we started doing practical stuff, we realized how much hot air and, and, and bullshit people would, would say, like, you don't need an $80,000 camera. You don't need these expensive lenses. You know, my old boss was Phil Tippett, who created all the creatures in the original Star Wars movies. And he was part of the ILM, um, one of the first artists at ILM. And so was Lauren Peterson, who I've worked with, who was like the eighth employee at, at uh, ILM wow. and I'd be like wow what lenses did you use to shoot this stuff and they're like we just use regular Nikon lenses and you know it wasn't like these PL mounted things right. and whatever and I always kept that in the back of my mind I'm like if it was good enough for the original Star Wars movies it's hell good I enough for me to hear that. and I just think that a lot of people get caught up with like oh I need the most expensive camera the most expensive lenses the most expensive sound the most expensive and we were like we don't need any of that stuff and mm -hmm. Whenever, even when we're doing like high-end commercial stuff nowadays, the DPs usually hate us because we're like, you don't need that, you don't need that, you don't need that, you don't need that. They're like, no, I need this. I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah. You don't need that. I mean, so. that's so that's so encouraging to hear because it, I think it does get to a point where you check all the boxes, right? Okay, the new Blackmagic cameras, which is one of the prizes if you win this contest, by the way, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K is one of the prizes in addition to $10,000 worth of prizes. So yay, that's very exciting. Awesome. Um, but with that, you know, you get the extra step of more dynamic range. Yes. That's something that I've been really needing personally, but I found as I'm shooting with him, oh, I'm kind of good. Yeah. Right? And these are $1,300 cameras, $2,500 cameras. You can get a really solid piece of glass yeah. for $1,000 and oh my gosh, off yes. to the races. Yes. Yes, the one thing I do like is a lot of resolution because I do like to be able to get out of trouble in post, not yeah. to say, you know, fix it in post. Fix but it I in do post. Like, I do like to reframe shots yeah. and stuff like that. So I do like that 
extra resolution, mm -hmm. but again, what you, what you have nowadays is better than what some of the best movies were ever shot mm -hmm. with. So yeah. your iPhone is a better piece of equipment than what the Beatles used to record their, their albums. Just don't lose sight of that, you know? Wow, yeah. yes. With that said though, as we are fellow gearheads here, what did you shoot that film on? So we use all uh, still lenses. So they were all um, the Zeiss lenses. Hmm. Not that those are crappy lenses, are great no, lenses. Beautiful, yeah. uh, and we used the red, um, was it the Dragon? No, it was just the red, the Epic. Okay. Yeah. In the EF mount? Or, yes. Yeah. We had all different mounts. So I do like to have, I, what, what I do like about Canon is Canon tends to have like weirder lenses. So I like like crazy 5X magnification mm -hmm. lenses. So I have those on the Canon and then I have the Nikon ones as, as what well. What does that mean, 5X It could like, I mean, you could basically shoot water. You could film a glass of water and never want to drink water again. <laughs> like you'll see things like waving at you in your glass of water. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's Glad pretty, I cleared that up, interesting. Yeah, it's pretty terrifying actually. Oh, that's so cool. Um, so p talking about post, you know, you shot it, you went through, I'm sure it wasn't all shooting and then editing. I'm sure you had a blend of workflow. Um, but the article I read about it said that you had computers just going 24 seven, rendering yeah. things out. Um, so I'm, I'm curious gear wise as well, what makes a competent computer for a project like that? I mean, I'm sure you have the highest level of graphics cards, like what, what do you have running? So different computers for different things. So while you're working, you need fast uh, interaction with the computer. That is when you need a good graphics card because you need that fast feedback. But once it comes down to rendering, like you're just kicking it off, like just you just need brute force. The, right. the, uh, the interactivity with the computer is irrelevant because you're just saying process. Right. And that, at that point, you, we don't even have graphics cards. We would just have like a lot of CPU and a ton of RAM. Hmm. So we would get, we custom built these little computers that were about this big and we had, I think 10 of them or something. And they were just rendering 24 hours a day. Our house sounded like an aircraft carrier. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely horrible. It was so much heat that we, I remember we had a table kind of like that one that you guys can't see, but it was like a kitchen grade table at Ikea. And it was like, oh, you could put up a, a pot on top of it and it won't, it won't get damaged. And we burnt a hole in the table with the computers because they were so oh. hot that they <laughs> melted the stuff that was approved for you to put a hot pot on oh, so it was pretty gosh. nuts yeah. so when you say you you built were they just like little like nooks little, like little tiny little things okay. yeah and then like what specific cpus would you have in there uh i mean at this point they're older but it was the i7s uh i don't remember exactly how many gigahertz they had they had 16 gigs of ram each and they were okay. all solid state okay yeah so but zero graphics cards so wow yeah Whenever I'm reviewing computers and I want to show off the graphics power, that's when I do open up Maya and you know I'm able to show it off. But when I'm in that program, it looks so intimidating. It looks so amazing to see an example project because you're working with you know, animated objects, but you're bouncing shadows off of them and you're uh, applying different textures. And it seems so intimidating in the beginning, but for the people out there who might want to start their visual effects journey, you know, they're inspired by you. What is a good starting point? Where do you even start? Well, Maya is definitely, I, I think if you're a filmmaker, learning Maya is important, but I think the most important thing is getting better at compositing, whether it's Nuke or After Effects. But in terms of Maya, the great thing nowadays is with YouTube, you could just find a million tutorials. And then like I teach at Noman School of Visual Effects and not to you know, plug them, but they do have an online school as well, which is amazing. Uh, if you want to learn this stuff, you can learn it now better than ever. I mean, it's a great time to want to pick up anything. Yeah. So YouTube and like I said, you could go to Noman as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I forget, I mean, how I learned everything is off of YouTube. Yeah. So it, it really is all out there, which is, which is so encouraging. But yeah. how long did it take for, for you to go from the beginning to, hey, I'm working on a movie, I'm working on a feature film. Have you been doing this since? The dawn of time? No, so so early on, like when I was like 17, I I wanted to, to do stop motion animation. That was my thing. Like Nightmare Before Christmas was like the movie that like blew my mind and Ray Harryhausen and all that stuff. And those were my gods. And Phil Tippett in particular was like 
who I ended up being able to work for. Like those were my superheroes. And uh, I started doing stop motion stuff and I tried to get into a 2D animation program at CalArts and I got rejected, which actually was a good thing because 2D animation completely died in the, in the United States. And, um, but I was always trying to do my own stuff. I got sidetracked once I got um, into visual effects and got a job and everything. But at a certain point, I was like, I gotta go back to making my own stuff mm -hmm. because that's where I felt like I could combine everything that I was passionate about, music and, and art and everything. Just, it was just the greatest form of art, I think. So mm -hmm. I started, I bought a red camera and this is a, this is a bad, bad advice, but I was like, I'm gonna buy a red camera because it's so expensive that it's not gonna allow me to screw around and just not do anything with it. So I'm like, I'm gonna buy the red one. It was so much money. I'm like, I will force myself to yeah. make stuff. And that's exactly what happened. So I'm mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta create something. I gotta create something. This thing is so expensive. And I was working for Phil Tippett at the time and I started renting the camera back to Tippett Studios mm -hmm. with the condition that they let me operate the camera. So I started learning a lot about the camera on the job. So I was doing like miniature photography for Drag Me to Hell, mm -hmm. for the Twilight movies. I got to shoot like all the visual effects elements for that. Wow. So that was kind of cool. That's amazing. And yeah. it's kind of thinking outside of the box where, hey, I make this initial investment. It makes you valuable to people yeah. in positions of power where you can say, hey, let me help. Yeah. I, I'm skilled and even I think the most important thing for people to remember is no one completely knows what they're doing. At a certain level, you just have to throw yourself into things and yes, prepare, yes, do the homework. But when you when you get on a set, everyone doesn't completely know what Nobody they're doing. Nobody really knows what they're doing. I still <laughs> don't know what the hell exactly. I'm doing. Exactly. Like even when I'm working on a creature, it's funny because I've done like a lot of like training tutorial videos and they're kind of deceptive in the sense that when you watch it, this person, myself, or everybody who's ever made one, has already gone through the process, figured out the problems for that particular tutorial. So when you see them do it, it's, it's almost like a linear thing. But the truth is, it's half the time it's like, thing. oh, that sucks, let's go back. Yeah. Wow, that sucks, let's go back. Do this, that sucks. Mm -hmm. And you keep doing this until eventually it works. I think everybody's like that. Mm -hmm. If you could just do it like in a, in a perfect straight line, like. Well, you're, an, you're much cooler than I am, yeah. <laughs> and it's so, so much so, even uh, going back to the challenge, even though it's a 60 second video challenge, there's still story elements. Like you should be telling somewhat of a story and that, that requires a certain timeline. And I know for me, when I'm editing my videos, I love the editing part. I'm more of an editor than the filmer. So I'm always trying to figure out the story in the edit, I right? love editing, yeah. Yeah, I, I love editing too. But for this, it seems like, you do need a narrative. Yes. There, there is, um, you know, some preparation needed. Maybe a script needs to be written out. Certain elements. So, how do you form a proper story when it's, you know, less documentary, less figuring it out in the edit? What is your process? Does the script come first? For does, story. Yeah, for for story. So, like we were talking about earlier about like Grover Krantz, the anthropology professor. Like I always like to reverse engineer my stories. I'm like. Like right now, I'm trying to come up with something that involves conquistadors, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I really love conquistadors and I feel like they've never been done in a fantasy setting. So you reverse engineer this stuff. You're like, okay, I love conquistadors. Start researching all these really cool characters that were around in that time and starting to basically almost like hip hop. Like you're grabbing yeah. these pieces from all these different stories and combining them together. And that's how we end up coming up with a story. So it's stealing from history, which is the same as a Game of Thrones. Most of those stories are stolen from actual historical events, but stealing from the best, which is millions of years of people killing each other and doing horrible Makes things. It's for an other. exciting yeah. story. It's not the best, but yeah. in terms of storytelling, it's yes. exciting, right? Yeah. And I love what you said, pulling from different things. It's yes. not just enough to be, hey, I'm going to make a film about conquistadors, uh, but what about putting them in a fantasy setting, yes. adding those little elements that can make it different, can make it fun and intriguing. Uh, if you were making the 60 second film, what would you do? Give them a little starting point. So first I would look at what I have available, what your family has available, of course, like <laughs> your friends, your friends and, yeah. and your family and try the to find actors. 
again, try to find the primal things that we're all afraid of. Like even while we're recording this, we're hearing footsteps up above us. If no one was here but me and I kept hearing those footprints, That'd I'd be, be freaking terrified. Yeah. yeah. So just using that stuff. Um, and again, just remember it's the basic things which are scary. Like everybody's afraid of the same things, right? Darkness, the unknown, the, the, the shadow moving in the corner, you know, is there someone looking through the windows at night? You know, the same stuff, mirrors are terrifying, all that stuff. So just use the things that naturally scare you, scare your little nephews and use that. That's. Do you have you know. any quirks that you have to do where when I go to bed, I have to have the door a little bit shut? It can't be, because for some reason in my brain, I want it to be easy to run out of my bedroom if I need to, but I need some air. Like for me, that goes back to just childhood for some reason of being scared of just a, like a door fully closed or a door fully open for someone to come and get me. Well, that might be me, but do you have any? <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny, like my house is full of like monster stuff, exorcist posters and skulls and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, I love horror stuff, but if I see real blood, I'll faint and I have to go to sleep with like a pumpkin candle, like a scented candle. It makes me sleep so much better. So I like a totally poser monster guy. Like I like That's amazing. So not a lot candles. scares Just, you. No, no. Okay. Okay. And in terms of your, you're grading this contest. So what are you looking for when you see the submissions in terms of how it looks, how it sounds, how it feels? I think the biggest thing is the performances of the actors one, and don't worry about the visual effects or trying to make something that it's going to impress me in terms of visual effects. Like, that's not going to impress me. I think how creative you are with what's on the other side of the door, the, the actors that you cast, the performance that they bring, and the building up of suspense and the subversion of what, what, you know, what is on the other side of the mm -hmm. thing. Is, 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 is it a demon or is it, is it a poodle? <laughs> you know, you don't know. I think, uh, but I think the acting and, and uh, the suspense is probably mm -hmm. the best. Yeah. I don't want to give them everything. However, what do you think is more valuable? Revealing the, the thing in the end or leaving it as a cliffhanger? Or maybe, you know, of course, there's, there's two different ways to approach that. But what do those do for the story? If it's horror, I think the less you show, the better. Okay. If it's comedy, you have to show it. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so there's different ways people can approach oh, this. Totally. Maybe it starts off scary and it ends with a laugh. That's my type of horror. I'm not a big horror yeah. person. Well, I mean, like, okay, for example, again, the, the people walking up above, like yeah. if it was nighttime and we were terrified, oh my God, there's a guy upstairs and or there's a monster upstairs. It's probably an old lady watering her plants. Like. <laughs> Usually horror stuff is comedic when you right. finally realize what it is. Right. right. So the contest opens on September 30th and it closes on November 4th. So that means November 5th. Uh, Miguel is going to be judging your videos. I always say judging. It seems very judgy, but it will be a fun experience because we're going to see all of your submissions. It has been so fun to see uh, throughout all the collective contests. You guys are talented, super talented. Um, and then the winner will be announced on November 15th exclusively on the collective contest. And then also there's additional prizes. You can be the runner up and win prizes, but also behind there's a behind the scenes prize where if you post on Instagram um, some behind the scenes, you can win prizes as well. So prizes all around. It's going to be very exciting. Um, but at the end of the day, what the coolest part is, you get to not only practice, but have this work of art to show people and to prove, hey, I can make the films, I can do this. Um, and so with that, I'm curious, what were some of your first projects where you were with the camera, you were responsible for editing? For me, it was wedding films, which I never want to go back to. But what, so, <laughs> what was the, the beginning? So first song was like stop motion films. So I did a few of those. They're probably terrible, but I loved them. I loved the idea of like you, it's the first time like you realize, wow, it's just a magic trick, right? Yeah. Uh, but then the first project, project that I consider like one of my babies was like the Green Ruby Pumpkin, which we did to try to get into commercial. So that was always like our plan was like, let's buy the red, let's try to do one short to, to try to get into commercials. And then after a few years, we'll get into film. Mm -hmm. So the Green Ruby Pumpkin is the one where I was like, 
I have to figure out how to use Nuke. I've never used Nuke before. Let's learn that. I don't know about cinematography. I don't know about anything. That was the project that we threw ourselves in and we figured everything out. And, mm -hmm. and that's online as well. It's just a green ruby pumpkin. Very cool. Yeah. In terms of passion projects versus commercial, how do you find time for both? Because on one hand, you have to eat. On the other hand, uh, probably what you found, which is uh, for me as well, my passion projects always lead to something good, yeah. right? But how do you balance that? Well, I try to, that's why I like to teach, because I actually hate to do commercial work. <laughs> uh, I'm very bad at doing things that I don't believe in hmm. or that I'm passionate about. I'm terrible at it. I'm yeah. the worst person for that. So I'd much rather teach, which I am passionate about, to you know, be your nine to five, not your nine to five, but the thing that helps you pay the bills yeah. when you need that, um, rather than doing commercial stuff. Yeah. So I do like, if I'm filming stuff, I want it to be my stuff only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even when we get, we would get offered to do visual effects stuff or creature designs, we usually turn everything down. Wow. So we, the last stuff we did is we, we uh, had a team working on designs for Godzilla 2. So um, that a was probably, film. yeah, and, Cr and Krampus, we worked on that as well, but we only do like really big stuff. And even that we tried to not do that. So interesting. Yeah. I'm curious, a creature, like how long does it take to make one creature from, from scratch? And I know that's a general well, question. Well, there's different but... stages. So at first, we always try to do everything in 2D, like just drawing it. And we work a lot with a guy, um, a friend of ours called Sohail, and he helps us doing some of the 2D stuff. We do some of the 2D stuff as well. That could take, that usually is what takes the longest because that's where you're trying to find the, the, the visual language of the character. And are you like on a tablet, a walk on tablet? Back on, on tablet, okay. yeah. And then, comes the 3D part. So that's where you have to sculpt it, model it. You have to then make it, uh, you have to have like proper topology so it could deform correctly. You have to you texture it. You literally sculpt it like in real life? It, with, you sculpt it on the computer. Just in the program, okay. So it's like digital clay. Gotcha. And that's Mudbox, which we use exclusively. Gotcha. We love it. Um, that whole process, grabbing a model, sculpting it, texturing it, putting the fur, takes about a month and a half. And then you have to do the face shapes, which is all the different expressions. Mm -hmm. So a character on the Ningyo had around 600 face shapes. So that would take about a month and a half as well. So it would take three months. For example, in the scene in the Ningyo where the guy's walking through the corridor, you see these creatures for one shot, and that's three months, three months, three months. And you mm -hmm. see like four or five of them. But again, we wanted to, to sh build this world, and the only way to do that is to... Right. Yeah. It's probably the exact opposite for you where you have to take long periods of time to work out the details of your films and me, I'll make one YouTube video in one week. So for me, it's always refreshing when I get one big project that I can really dive in and spend time on. For you, is it almost the opposite where maybe you do have a commercial project that's only gonna take a few weeks and it's, oh, it's like a sense of relief? Or do you really value those big projects that take years? The next projects that we do, we wanna do like, we wanna force ourselves to get it done in like a month. Wow. Like I actually think that's a good thing. I think getting stuck on these things for three years isn't really the greatest thing. Like, and I say that we've, we've benefited a lot from the Nino, right? We signed to CAA, we sold the film to one of the biggest producers. So we got a lot of good things out of that. But I do think that there's a lot to gain from just doing a lot of quantity up mm -hmm. front. Yeah, just getting better at your craft, yeah. How do you think that evolves as time goes on? As you, you know, you're in the beginning, do everything and anything. Do you think that there's value down the line to narrow your focus? Or are you more narrowed down on directing, building films? Or are you always going to be the visual effects artist at heart? No, if I never do visual effects again, I'll be fine with it. <laughs> like I've paid my dues. You've paid I have, your dues, you're yeah, good. Yeah. I have traced human hairs for a month at a time. Oh my gosh. Like when you really feel like you look at a shot, you're like, I'm gonna have to trace every hair on this woman or this man for the next month. My God, my yeah. God, this yeah. sucks. Yeah. So if I never do that again, I won't mind, but I will always have a hand in the visuals. I just, I just naturally think that way. Right. So um, 
But again, yeah. <laughs> I'm traumatized. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those things where I, I can't compare editing a video to visual effects, but it's one of those things where it takes so long. It'll take me ten hours for one video, and you try to delegate it, but it's not perfect. Yeah. So you're like, oh, I just have to take this all on again. I, you know, it's in the details. That's where when I like it when I'm doing it, but you have to get to a point. Where you move on a little bit, right? Yeah. And was that kind of first delegation difficult for you when you're like, you know what, maybe I don't want to be drawing these millions of hairs? Well, I haven't gotten to the point where I could truly delegate it. Like when we do big commercial projects, that's when we could delegate it. But on our personal stuff, it's we're always the ones carrying that load. It makes me feel better that you go through that too. Yeah. You know, there's always going to be times where you have to do everything. I think yeah. that's a, a part of filmmaking. Yeah, you know what? You know what I do like about it. I think that as a director, you want to be the second best person at every job on mm -hmm. set. So if the cinematographer dies, it sucks, <laughs> but it won't look as good. But let's shoot this. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah, let's that's go. That's a great perspective. And 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 that applies even to the visual effects side because once we're doing a commercial and we're getting bids in, we're like, why is that so expensive? And you realize how much people are constantly trying to take advantage to get a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. So if you truly know how to do the whole process, you truly know how not to get screwed over by people and how to budget things properly because. You could do it yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do it yourself. You're not going to do it as good as the person who you're going to hire. But that's a great perspective yeah. too. If you know all the nitty gritty, you know a fair price to charge. You know kind of how they should be doing their job. That's what I love about the evolution of indie filmmaking. Is a lot of it is with cameras that are maybe a thousand dollars you instantly have a distribution platform, whether it's YouTube or Instagram, and you can get eyes on it like that. And you can learn fast and you can move on. And uh, that's what's so cool about these collective contests. That's what's so cool just about creating in general, which is so fun. Um, and, and yeah, it's so cool. Have you embraced all of these platforms? Or, or what What would you say your, your jam is in terms of a platform? Vimeo. Vimeo, okay. Vimeo's our thing. I think that Staff picks mm. and short of the week of yeah. are probably the most important film festivals you could get into at this mm. point. I mean, you know, not obviously Sundance and Tribeca and stuff like that, but I think like the run of the mill festival, short of the week, staff picks are much higher yeah. because the amount of eyes you'll get on staff picks versus a film festival in, you know, Missouri or something. Mm -hmm. It's just a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. And the same people from Missouri are going to see it anyway. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you don't have to buy that plane ticket. You don't, you don't have, have to buy the expensive film ticket. Yeah. The barrier for entry is so low, but that means at the same time, you got a lot of people rubbing elbows with you and, and competing. So yes. it's even more of a reason to try to stand out. Yes. What do you think makes people stand out in this day and age? I think story is always king. I think, I do think that the quality of the image is more important than people give it credit for. And I think a lot of people go, oh, no one cares about that stuff. The story is the single most important thing. It's true. But people also also care about the quality of the mm -hmm. image. And having be a beautiful image is actually really important, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Well, the story is still king, but. Yeah, yeah. for sure, for sure. Um, it was so great chatting with you. Do you have anything else to put out in the world for our collective audience who, they're filmmakers, but they're still trying to level up their skills right now? I mean, I think the biggest lesson I've, I've learned and I keep not paying attention to my own advice is <laughs> don't bite off more than you could chew. Really try to do something that you could get done that looks great, that has a great story but that you're not stuck on it for like four years the mm -hmm. way we have. Um, and just doing as much stuff as possible. Mm -hmm. A lot of content is the key, yeah. Do, do, do. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Awesome, yeah. well thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, guys, make sure to check out collective.lacy.com slash behind the door. We are so excited to see your submissions. Make them scary, make them spooky, make them fun. Um, and thank you so much for joining us.
Thank you guys. Check us out on YouTube, Instagram, all the things. His links will also be in the description below. And thanks for checking us out. See you on collective.lc.com. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.